Okay, I'm back. And uh, so we're going to continue with the rest of this right now. Uh, let's see what we've still got to do. Um, we've just done, we've just talked about uh, super blocks and um, things of that type. And now we're going to go on and talk about file systems. Now, file systems, every operating system has to have files and has file systems. Well, maybe they don't have to, but every operating system I've ever used has files and uh, and uh, disk drives or, or, or something that looks like a disk drive, even if it's physically something like that. Um, and so we need to talk about file system types. <coughs> Every operating system has its own file system types. Um, MS-DOS had the FAT16 and the FAT32. Well, at least the FAT16 and then the FAT32 was pro maybe made after MS-DOS. But it, in order to make use bigger disk drives and things of that type. But it was a very DOS-like system. Uh, it doesn't really fit Windows that well if it's the DOS world. Uh, Windows came up with a um, its own file system, and its file system is called uh, NTFS. Um, new NT for new technology. I I'm not sure. Anyway, it's NTFS. Windows has been using that for many years now. It's a good file system. It's a caching fa file system. It's fast. It's uh, fairly reliable. It's a good file system. They may use some other file systems as well. I'm not part of the Windows world, so yeah, uh, you know, their day-to-day -day file system is NTFS. <coughs> um, I will say one thing about um, the difference between FAT32 and FAT and NTFS, FAT32 or the FAT file systems are, they were kind of meant for floppy drives in the uh, floppy disk in the beginning. Don't have a floppy disk at my fingertips here. Um, or a floppy, <laughs> or, <laughs> or a drive to put one in. <coughs> but not only did they have low capacity, they were easy to pop in and out of a system. So you could easily pop them out of a system while the system was running. And Windows, uh, DOS wasn't very sophisticated in the beginning. And, um, um, and the computers, you know, people often would just hit the power switch to take them off and things like that. So inherently in the way people use computers at that time, there was a lot of uh, possibilities for disk corruption. And the FAT32 base, or the FAT file systems basically write, uh, work on, they've got some information, they write it to disk. They've got some information, they write it to disk. Of course, writing, reading and writing to disk is a slow process, especially a floppy disk. And the result of that is that FAT file systems run pretty slow because they've got to be writing to disk all the time. I don't know if they totally do that anymore or not, but but they're still slow. So basically, it's likely they do. Um, NTFS is a caching file system. Basically, at a certain point in time, they said, we've got to make this work faster. So when we want to write to disk or read from disk, instead of writing from disk, you know, one um, cluster at a time, what we will do is we will write this into a little cache up in RAM because we can do that fast and just continue with going. And then every now and then when the system gets a bit of time, it will take that cache and write it down onto disk. So it's kind of a two-step process. First, they write to this high-speed cache, and then it goes down onto disk. Likewise, when they read, they may read a bigger chunk off of the disk and keep it up in uh, RAM. And then 
they can read from that really quickly if if that happens to be if the stuff you want happens to be stuff they grabbed up into RAM. Otherwise, it's got to go down to the disk and get it. Um, but that makes for a fast file system. And most file systems today are caching file systems. However, because everything's up in, because there's a lot of stuff up in RAM, and it only gets written down every few seconds to the hard disk, um, you're <coughs> If somebody turns off the computer all of a sudden or pulls the hard drive out of the system, um, only part of the file gets written down. And um, there's a lot of possibilities for disk corruption. There's still possibilities you know, for disk corruption with the FAT file systems, but it's less. <coughs> OK. Um, so basically, with any disk, with any file system, it's a really it's important to make sure your system is quiet when you remove the device. By quiet, well, in essence, you don't know what's happening. So what that really means is that you want to officially eject the device, or you mount the device, or unmap the device, uh, something to get it out of the operating system because that will flush all the buffers out onto disk. And of course, there's a little command in Linux or Unix is to do that called sync, which will uh, force everything onto disk. But still, what you really want to do is, is you want to do U-mount. Um, um, OK, next thing is, um, so now I've talked quite a little bit about the Windows file systems and Linux and and, and um, DOS file systems, but the concepts are the same with the Unix ones. It's um, not really different concepts. So why are there different file systems and different types of file systems? Well, there are several reasons. Some of them perform better than others. Some of them perform better with certain types of files. So on a database, you might want to use this sort of file system on a, a oh, something with um, um, lots of little tiny files. You might want to use a different type of file system. Um, besides, you know, it's like um, um, hamburger joints. They're, well, they're all McDonald's now, aren't they? Well, every, it's like bars. Everybody wants to start their own. They don't want to be part of some big chain and do it the way everybody else does. So I, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons, and we'll get into that, <clears throat> the reasons why people have different file systems. But in terms of the NTFS file system, why don't we just use that on Linux? Or why don't we just use FAT32 file system? You know, they're not bad. Actually, I just said NTFS is a good file system. Well, the thing is, is the file systems are so intertwined with the operating system that it doesn't work. Or it, maybe, maybe you can do it, but you can't do it fully. You can use NTFS on Linux or on any, well, on Linux. I won't say on any Unix, but, but on Linux. But um, but you lose certain things. As an example of something you might lose is, uh, remember I said all those access rights were tied up with the in uh, um, the inode table. The access rights of a file and the owners of a file and the group associated with the file is all kept in the inode table. But in TFS, Windows uses a totally consistent completely different permission system. They don't even have inode tables. So it would be made very hard to make a Unix work using uh, work all the way using NTFS. You and it might run slow and you know uh, it because NTFS wasn't designed for Unix. Okay, let's look at file systems that are designed for uh, um, Unix. We'll do that in just a moment. I will say there's also various types of file systems designed for 
uh, DVDs, um, the ones, um, they're all based on the ISO 9660 standard. Um, there's, and then that standard really doesn't let you have long file names and various things. So there's specializations on the way you use that standard. Uh, UDF is, I believe Microsoft uses the word UDF to describe their file systems. Uh, Rock. Uh, Rock Ridge is a standard. Juliet is a, a standard. And I, I believe those are all specializations. They're really extensions to ISO 9660. Um, so for what that's worth. Now, in terms of Unix file systems, I clumped all the Unix file systems together because since they all have inode tables and stuff, <coughs> There's quite a bit of freedom between one's abilities to go from, um, say, like a Solaris file system to a Linux file system to a FreeBSD file system. Sorry about the phone, but I can't really disconnect it. Um, the um, because they all have inode tables. So it's conceivable that you could make Linux read and write a some sort of Solaris file system like a ZFS and it would do it just fine. And in many cases, Linux can deal with a lot of file systems that maybe were inherited from SGI or from Sun or from other Unixes, although they've got their own set of file systems as well. Uh, and most people use, well, I'd say most people use those, but uh, there is a movement towards it, um, a couple that have non-Linux uh, origins. Okay, the file systems in Unix that are typically used was, I believe in the old days, I, I believe the first Unix file system I think, I don't know, was called EXT and was written by, I think, Remy Card in France. I'm not sure. Uh, it worked well, but had some flaws, so they came out with EXT version 2, which was used for decades, or at least a decade, maybe a couple, a decade and a half. And then um, that file system wasn't perfect. Um, basically, if your system crashed, if you had an EXT file system, it took a long time to for the system to repair the file system to get it back up and running again. So it didn't work good on, say, a cell phone where you want to turn it off and on all the time and things get, you know, you, you, you have to deal with disk corruption really quickly. So they came up with EXT3 file system. And then there's been some modifications. And today, most of us use an EXT4 file system. Um, the EXT file systems have a long honored place in Linux heritage. Nearly all distributions are using the EXT3 or 4 mostly ext4 file system at this point. Um, there are a few oddball distributions that use other file systems. SUSE has a long history of experimenting with file systems a little bit before anybody else does. For a long time, they used the riser file system, riser fs. That's a good file system. I've used it a lot. Um, um, it works well. It works particularly well, I believe, if you have um, a lot of small files. I think it is. I don't remember. But I've used it. And don't worry too much about which one works best for which. Just use your, de uh, your distribution's default file system until you're really ready to play with something else. And that could be decades. Um, the um, your system's default file systems work well, so I, I would, you know, I recommend using them. But I want you to know what some of these others are because you know things are changing. Um, another one 
So we've talked about the EXT file systems. We've talked about Riser. Um, I see oh, SUSE has just gone to using two new file systems that I am not familiar with. The machine I'm running right now is a SUSE machine, but it's a little bit older. It uses EXT4. How, and they gave, um, older SUSE systems did use Riser FS for a while. But the truth is Hans Riser, the inventor of the uh, file system, unfortunately murdered his wife and is in prison for life. So uh, there is still a company and stuff that keeps the riser file system together, but a lot of people have moved away from that file system. Um, and SUS did that. They moved back to EXT4. And now I see in their latest revision, they are using, they put the root partition on something called a BT RFS partition. I don't know much of anything about it. And they put the rest of the system on a F on an XFS partition. And I know nothing about that either. But it appears as though the B um, BTRFS file system appears to um, I believe it lets you do snapshotting and keep backups that you so you can fall back to things. Well, not a real backup, but a sort of backup. Um, I mean, not a backup like if you lose your hard disk, you still lose your hard disk. This is just kept on the same partition. And it lets you do snapshotting so that if you make a change in the system and it's really not a good change, you can fall back to that, uh, to the previous uh, uh, system, to the way the system was before you made the change that fouled up your system. The XFS file system, I think, is a movement to make a file system that's expandable and more dynamic than the previous file, than it, other file systems. So for people that know what LV, um, LVM is, I think it's kind of putting part of LVM into um, uh, uh, into a file system like and calling it FXS. But I don't know because I haven't used it yet. It's got lots and lots of options. And well, I've got a couple machines up that do have it, but I really haven't explored it yet. That's, I just, you know, I've never used it until the beginning of, of um, until a month or so ago. Okay. There is one called ZFS that's gotten a lot of publicity. The ZFS file system does not run on Linux, but I expect it will one of these days. It's, um, I believe it was invented by Sun to run on Sun Solaris machines. And nowadays it runs on lots of uh, BSD style machines. I think FreeBSD, some other machines of that type. It's supposed to basically incorporate the features of LVM and everything under the sun and works really well. And it does apparently work real well because certain people with file servers and whatnot that usually run, say, Linux, actually will make their file servers on a, Z, on a, a FreeBSD system so they can run the ZFS. So. Uh, in some operations, there's, you know, advantages to that. Well, okay. Given that, uh, we'll go on to the next item here. With every file system, there's going to be some file system commands. And um, most of which you almost never use, but they are used in the background. And occasionally, you may have to use one. Or, well, yes, it, uh, once in a while, you'll want to use one. So you should know they exist. Let's look at our file systems here. We'll do this again. Um, and this tells us what type of file systems we have. I notice the home directory is an ext4 directory. Now let's look and remember I'm logged on as root. There's a lot of e commands. e2 commands. And 
and I'm not even sure what all those are. That shows how often I use it. But I think E2 free frag is a defragmentation command. E2 image is, I don't know, when in doubt, don't type it because as root you can destroy a lot of stuff. But let's do a um, man page. Anytime in doubt, do a man page. Saves critical um, ext two, three, four file system data uh, metadata to file. Okay. I, quite frankly, I've never used that command. E2 label is a way of putting a label on your file system. Um, okay, the one that I really want to talk about a little bit at some point is E2FS or E2FC FSCK, which I'll talk about in a moment. No. Which I'll talk about right now. Okay. Um, that's a command that you could use, but there's a lot of similar commands. The general command is FSCK, just like that. Let's clear this. FSCK. That is a command to try to repair corruption in your file system. It, it, remember in in Windows, I'm sure there's something. Uh, I, I know there's something. In the DOS days, that used to be called check disk. And what it would do is it would try to repair corruption in your file system because your file systems, all file systems get a bit of corruption with time when things like um, computers go down, they crash hard in the middle of something and a file only gets half written to disk. So you've got broken pointers going from one cluster to the next cluster. Well, the next cluster doesn't exist, but there's a pointer to it that does exist. Um, things of that type, and you've got to be able to handle that some which way. Um, maybe you've got to add, maybe a spot in the disk has kind of gone weak and you want to add that to the bad spot file. Uh, there's lots of things that can happen that produce corruption on the disk. Minor, usually minor corruption, <laughs> hopefully minor corruption. But sometimes things go bad. You've got to have a command to fix that. The command in Linux and some other Unixes to fix that is FSCK. And uh, so let's do man on FSCK. And it's got a billion options. It's got options to do things like, um, and uh, fortunately we rarely need them. But it's got options like, remember I said if your super block got hosed, you might have to go to an alternate super block. Well, this command, you can tell it to read from a secondary or third area super block. Um, so that if things go bad, you can go to another super block. Um, it's got, and it's just got a lot of commands for repairing your file system. Your disk has to be unmounted, U-mounted, before you use this command, which is a problem if you're on the root directory. So it's got some special options that say, you know, uh, you, uh, uh, you mount the root directory, run this command, and then remount the root directory. There's some special options for the root directory. Um, usually this command gets ran automatically every, I don't know, 40 reboots of your system or something. And so often, if you've got a really smooth, well-running system, you probably don't manually have to run this command hardly ever. but not all systems are really smooth and well running, and sometimes you do have to run this command manually. Also, if there is a broken file after running this command, you'd like to get the name of that file because that file, like if it's missing clusters, you know, you could be missing a lot of your file and 
that's a sign that maybe that file, you'd better go to your backup media and get that file off the backup media to replace the messed up file with one from the backup media because FSCK can terminate the file, fix up the, the broken pointers, make everything look cosmetically good or structurally sound, but it won't invent data that has been lost. So the file may, it will then be structurally sound, but it won't be um, um, but it won't be right. So you got to go to the backup media and get the um, get the um, the file from the backup media um, and replace it. And um, and that of course is the same for I any operating system, uh, Windows included. I know people don't normally talk about that in Windows until you take some of the more advanced classes, but you know. It's the same thing. An operating system, files get corrupted. You've got to do something about them. It's the very, very same thing. Um, let's see what we have here. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. I will say, normally when I, I I'm not going to do FSCK because I don't want to U-mount one of my disks. Um, but if I did it, I think I do FSCK. I think there's a minus T EXT four slash home, something like that. That would do a very simple EXT um, uh, check disk on my home directory. Uh, uh, ooh, assuming the home directory is U mounted, so I can't use home because once I U mount the directory I don't know where it is so I would do something like slash um, dev slash sdb6 that would have to be the syntax I'd use and it worked fine the alternative to that is I think there was this e2fck thing I could have used that command and then I wouldn't have to use the minus t ext4 um, or there are a whole host of commands that start ex or fsck just like with the mkfs for um, uh, formatting a file system. There's a lot of commands that just start with fsck and then I'll do two tabs to expand, get all my options. So there is like fsck.ext4, uh, fsck.msdos, uh, fsck. Um, um, riser fs, and I could use those like this. fdb Six. And that would go off and fix my file system. I don't know how long that takes. Usually it's only a minute or two. Depends on how big your file system is, how fast your computer is, and how much corruption there is on the file system. But if there's no corruption, usually these things come back 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Um, uh, it depends. In a worst case where I've had a lot of file corruption, I've had a broken super block, I've had this, it's probably taken me several hours to figure out where the alternate super blocks are and, um, and, and do enough to actually fix my file system well enough to use it. Um, the other thing is I just said that, you know, if you've got a broken file, you may have to go to your backup media and get the new copy of that file. Why don't I just delete that file, go to the backup and get a new copy? Why do I do an FSCK to fix the broken file so it's structurally okay but not good? Well, if you've got all these broken pointers and stuff, bad things can happen. Sometimes you'll find you just can't delete the file. 
Um, sometimes you find your copy commands don't work. Uh, uh, certain commands just may not work because of all these pointers all fouled up. I can't tell you what will go wrong, but because it's unpredictable, it depends on which pointers are screwed up and, you know, things of that type. Okay. So much for that. And, um, you know, um, try making some directories or uh, try making a file system and using FSCK on it. And, uh, you know, well, you should try using all these commands. M M um, MKFS, F FSCK, um, which you'll use a thousand times more often than you will MKFS. Um, although MKFS you're likely to use more often where you actually type it in as opposed to having it ran automatically. But you'll use both of these. Okay, the mount and U mount commands. In Windows, there's what you can map a disk drive, a part, a, a file system onto your system, and you can unmap it. Usually, we do that where we're mapping remote shares, but it, you know, but it works the same for local systems. Um, the command in Unix to do that is umap. Now, I've got. Um, we had a disk drive here, didn't we? Uh, let's do this. Remember yeah, uh, from before, from part one, we had this uh, disk drive on SDG. Let's see what we've got here. OK, so we should be able to now, the um, swap partition you cannot mount. To use the swap partition, I would use that by using the um, swap on command. But, um, but, but the file system I could mount. So I should be able to mount that thing. It won't work. But I should be able to mount that thing by doing a command like slash MMT, because we're going to mount that on MMT, um, slash DEV slash SDG G2. Oh, I got these in the wrong order. They won't work anyway, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but that's the idea. Whew. That did work. OK, I didn't think that would work because I didn't think we had a um, file system there. But apparently, we do. It's an ext4 file system. I must have made that in part one and couldn't remember that I made that um, by using the MKF. I, I'm vaguely recalling. Um, that I did make that by using the MKFS command. I'm sorry, I'm actually making these on two separate days and I can't remember what happened. But that is a case of mounting that file system. Well, given that I have that, then I ought to be able to use FSCK on that thing too. But remember, I say it cannot be mounted. So let's... Um, and so, see, I can go over here. I can put commands on it. Let's um, or put files on it. Let's um, oh, let's copy. There's a file. Okay. Notice I have ownership rights on that file. Well, uh, I won't worry about talking about ownership rights on the disk, just that they do work. They work pro uh, They work completely properly. If I had a Windows disk here, like an, uh, an NTFS disk, I could also go over here. I could write to it. I can read from it. The only thing is, is 
only one because ownership because there's no ownership there's no inode table what I have to do is I have to say that uh, root or demandle or some user has complete access to that disk and you know um, the access rights are not granular they're the whole disk has the same access rights because uh, whereas with a uh, Unix style disk the access rights work just the way they're supposed to. Okay, next, let me go get off this disk. I want to just use FSCK then. Let me do, um, I need to unmount that disk. So if I do U mount, and I'm not sure whether I should call that DEV slash SDG2 or maybe I can just get away with calling it uh, slash MNT. Well, if you experiment with this, you'll see that either works. I could call it either by the mount point or by the physical location. Either one will work just fine. Okay. So then we will do FSCK, ext4, slash dev. Now, could I do that by the mount point? We won't do it. Just think about it. Would that work? Well, not really. It should not work because as soon as we U mounted that disk, it no longer has that mount point. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't exist on the system, so I can't call it by the mount point. So I've got to, uh, but physically it's still in the same location, so I've got to call it by the physical address. SDG2. There it is. It is, it is fine. Um, now let me you mount it and that's all there was to it of course that's got one file on it and now there's no disk corruption <laughs> so you know you'll get lots and lots of output if there's lots of disk corruption um, but uh, with no disk corruption you know it it, it comes back relatively fast and um, and um, you know Everything's cool. Even if it was a big full disk, it would come back pretty fast. Okay, U mount. Oh, I don't want to U mount that. I want to mount it. There, there's my mount command. And I will mount that. Now, do I have to mount that on MMT? No, not really. I can mount that any place. Uh, let's mount that as, well, here. Let's create a directory. Make directory uh, slash home slash, nah, well, yeah, slash home slash dmandel slash um, bin. Is there a temp? Slash, um, oh. Oh, there's another temp. Under temp. I will make another temp. Okay. Uh, that's the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, way down my tree. Okay. But I could do a... Mount command like this. That should work. And guess what I have? That's where my um, directory is mounted. This can be very useful. Suppose I have one user. Suppose I keep all of my users under um, slash home. And suppose I have one user that's just a big disk hog. Um, you know, he does 
uh, he makes movies. And, you know, well, I'd probably have him on his own computer, but but, but for some reason, you know, he's a big disk hog. Well, he's using this on, this on our file server, and he's a big disk hog. Hog. So what do I do? I just simply, instead of his home directory being demandal on the same disk drive as everybody else's, I give him his own disk drive. I mount that in his home directory. So I use slash home slash demandal as a mount point to a six terabyte disk drive. And he's got his own disk drive to do whatever he wants with it. He's If he fills that up, it's not going to um, monkey with other people's disk or with other people's uh, file systems. And, you know, he can do his own thing. And that's very, very useful. Another place where that could be useful is if I have, if my root file system keeps filling up because slash var, people are doing it, sending too much stuff to slow, slow printers. And uh, I need more space in slash var. I can just throw on a new disk drive, copy everything from slash var onto the new disk drive, and then replace slash var um, use use slash var as the mount point for the new disk uh, or the new disk partition. That it, it, it gets me around a lot of problems. It's a good way of solving a lot of problems. Um, of course, I might be able to do that by using a link to a symbolic link, um, but that would be the topic of another talk. So I can't do that in this talk. Okay. Uh, there is one other um, option on the mount command that is kind of nice. Well, there's a couple options. One of them is mount by itself. What that does is that will list all of my mounts for everything that has been mounted. That used to be a very, very useful and handy command. Unfortunately, as the mounting has gotten so much more complex, where we've got file systems that have sub sub mounts and, and stuff, this is getting so long that it, it's becoming hard to read. And um, that's why you find that I'm using this command so much. Um, I used, I've in recent months, I've sort of replaced my usage of the mount command with the df command. Now, in the past, I, you you need both commands because they tell you different things. But um, the mount command listing has gotten hard enough to read that I tend to use the df command more than I did in the past. The mount command doesn't tell you how full the disk are. The df command tells you how full the disk are. Uh, the mount, you know, um, the mount df command tells you nothing about all the options being used on the mount. So you need the mount command for that. So they're both still very useful, but I'm finding that I'm percentage of my use has shifted uh, within the last, you know, couple of years, maybe. Um, I should mention one other thing while we're talking about disk stuff. Once in a while, I've, oh god, once in a blue moon, I mean, almost never, but once in a while, I've had it where I would try to write a file onto my disk. And it, it, and it would just say disk full. OK. So I do the df command, just like we did here. And I go up here. Well, that disk is kind of full, isn't it? Uh, the, the window slash d. But I would go up here, and I'd find that the disk was only 88% full. But when I tried to write a file to it, it said 100% full. That's actually not a good disk to use this on. But say this disk, it's it's only 94% full. And it would say that it was, um, uh, um, 
I can't. Anytime I write a file to it, it says disk full. Okay. What happens there is that what ha this is very rare, but what actually happens is the inode table is a fixed length. When you do, when you format your disk, it gives you the number of inodes you can use. If you know you're going to need lots and lots of teeny tiny files, then since every file needs an inode, what you do is an option on the MKFS command that says, you know, make a billion inodes. You can you can make it make more than inodes. The defaults almost always work for me. They're really good. But once in a while, I have had it where fundamentally what has happened is I have not ran out of disk space, but I have ran out of um, space in the inode table. So I can't add any more files. Then I would like to know how many inodes are being used. And I should be able to find that out with something like this, I think. Yeah, this tells me how many inodes are being used. And the, pers the number of free inodes I have and um, uh, all sorts of information about my inodes. This one down here looks very funny. This is 100% full. There's no inodes. Uh, there's no inodes, period, let alone inodes used. That's because that's a DVD. Uh, so, you know, DVDs are always 100% full because you can't write to them. Um, these here, I don't know what that means entirely uh, because that's actually a Windows file system type. That's an NTFS file system. and. I, yeah, I know tables don't exist, so I'm not sure the meaning of that. But the other ones, you know, the the Unix style file systems, the AXT4s, those inodes are real. And it is possible, although this won't happen once in every five years that you actually run out of inodes. OK, next we go on to FS tab file. There's two files under slash etc, fs tab and slash etc slash m tab. The important one of those, well, it depends on whether you're a person or a computer. For us people, <laughs> the important one of those is slash um, um, fs um, tab. If I want, and let's take a look at that file. Let's look at it in our good friend Emacs or VI. I don't care. Gives me some ugly colors, but oh well. Uh, I think it'd be easier to read in Emacs. OK, there's my FS tab file. And my FS tab file basically is a listing of things that you want this system to mount. Usually, it's things that you want the system to mount as it boots. And so when you do the install, install your system, it will uh, give you um, an FS tab. That usually works. But sometimes there will be something new that you want to um, um, have mounted. And then, like, I just added a disk here. So to add this disk, I would go in here. I would put in the disk location, dev slash sdg2. 
I'd put in the mount point. MNT. MNT is kind of a general mount point that people use, and usually they make subdirectories under MMT. Um, and um, um, uh, but you can use anything for a mount point. Uh, we'll use this one. Home slash dmandel slash tmp slash tmp slash tmp. Then I've got to put in the type of file it is. This is not an NTFS file. It's an ext4 file. And then I put in options. And I'll just put in defaults because I don't understand those. Actually, I do, but I'll just put in options. And then usually I put in I would have to do a man page to find out what to put in here. You can copy it from the last one. Um, I think, actually, though, I probably need a, well, what these have to do with is they have to do with um, whether that gets booted, whether the disk gets mounted automatically at boot time or whether the you can boot it um, or, or, or whether you can mount you have to mount it with a mount command after the system boots and sometimes you want it one way sometimes you want it the other way the, another thing is you can put in a lot of options up in here these options instead of defaults this one is users. That means any user on the system can execute the mount command. Normally, it's only root can execute mount. And there's other options. This one says who the group is that owns that. I don't know. You never use that, I don't think. Well, actually, you never use this if you're mounting a Unix file system. But if you're mounting a DOS or a Windows file system, you need that to say, um, what group, um, uh, you know, you need to put in information about access rights because there's, uh, because Unix doesn't use the Windows intrinsic access rights. Okay, and then you save that file and that's it. Now, in our case, I'm going to take that out of there. Um, save file. No. OK. And that's something you have to do manually every now and then. Now, I will just make a comment about the slash, the other file, the slash etc slash mtab file. That file is actually a binary file. The truth is it's a link. I, I think nowadays it's a link to a file under slash prog. And that is binary information about what's actually mounted at the moment. And the system keeps track of all that. And it is, um, we never deal with it. The system handles that based on the mounts that we've done and the uh, U mounts we've done. And that's just as good because the file's not, it's binary. It's only readable to computers, not to real people. Um, we've talked about file system corruption which is a good, or yet another good reason for keeping backups. It's all backups, meaning backup media someplace else, not attached to your system or, or whatnot, or on at least on a separate hard drive. And, or maybe we could just do that by using a RAID device, whatever RAID is, or a mirror disk. Except, this is a good point. If you get corruption on one disk, you're going to get corruption on your mirror disk. This is, a RAID is not a backup system. RAID can be very, very useful in some situations. Never, ever, ever let RAID replace your backups or you will lose data. 90% of all data losses um, would be just as lost on a RAID because they're through human error or they're through, you know, some other means that um, um, RAID won't take care of. 
<clears throat> Next, we're going to look at the DD command. The DD command, I, I just want to look at a little bit here because it's kind of a cool command. Um, DD is a copy command. And what I want to say here is every everything in Unix is a file. So disk drives are files. File systems are files. Everything's a file. And DD is a command that is made, it, it's just a copy command, just like CP, but it's got a lot of special features. It can do little tiny conversions as it does the copy. I think the reason DD was originally written was back in the old days when we used the big reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Uh, DD was really perfect for reading and writing from those tapes. But we use DD for a lot of screwy things to this day. Um, if we go over here, we could make a file if, if we'd want to. Where am I? Well, we're in root. Uh, we've got some space in root. Don't have a lot of space in root. Let's go over to um, Uh, let's become me. I, I don't think I need to be root to do this. So there I am. I, this is dmandel. Where am I? Let's go over to my home directory. Well, I guess I'm at that, but OK. And we're going to make a file, or we're going to basically make a file system using the dd command. Say I do dd space i f uh, that's input file and i'm going to do slash dev slash uh, under dev there's a file called zero i think which is just says all that is is point you know, it, it means it's a file filled with zeros <laughs> as many zeros as you want it's a special file it creates zeros on the fly or I could use RAN, which creates random numbers on the fly. But I'll, uh, it, traditionally, we use zero for this. I don't know why. Um, slash, oh, and then we need to make a file. We'll make uh, my file system. And then we need to. Uh, say how big we want this file system to be. Let's, um, we're going to write it so many blocks at a time. I could make these, and these are really meaningless for um, this purpose, uh, uh, in this situation. If this was a tape drive, it, this would actually s uh, define the block size on the tape. But uh, this is a disk drive, so it, it's pretty meaningless. We'll make it 1024. And then we'll make um, how many of these do we want to write out? So we'll put count as one. That would not write one of these. Well, let's see what that does. Guess what? I've got 1024 characters there. And I guess I could look at that, that by doing the OD command with the minus BC option, I think, or something like that. Um, my, whoop, my file system, guess what? It's filled with a lot of zeros. Uh, zeros everywhere. Well, let's make this a little bigger. Instead of making it one, let's make this um, two, two million. So that should make, um, what, two, um, two gigabytes in size or something like that. Um, how long will that take to run? If I'm curious how long it takes to run, I could put a time command before the rest of the command, and that will tell me how long it takes to run. So um, here we go. It's running. 
and this part of the video is getting along too. Maybe I should make these two separate things so you can have coffee in the middle of them. Um, my coffee's cold. There we go, 21 seconds. So let's look at the size of our file. Oh, well, it's still got zeros in it. It's about two, two gigabytes worth of those. So that, that's a good size file. Now, everything though is a, um, you know, everything's a file system. Uh, I mean, so uh, maybe that's a disk drive. I mean, it's file on the disk, but let's pretend it's a disk drive. M MK, um, F, no, let's do the F disk command. M my file system. Oh, well, I could actually partition this and make it uh, pretend it's a disk drive. I don't want to do that, um, but I could. I could make a whole disk drive here. I could then copy that onto this flash disk and, uh, you know, save it on here. It would format things as it goes and I'd just have a whole disk drive on here uh, made with this. Um, actually, I'd pre prefer just to make this file system. So we're going to go out of here. I could use this command on it too. Make file system. Uh, what sort of file system do we want to make here? I could make an NTFS file system if I want. Um, except um, I don't want to be that adventurous in the middle of a video. But um, let's make it... Uh, FFS. I, I don't. I, we might as well. I, I, you know, I'm getting a little more. Well, let's make it NTFS. I have made NTFS file systems with Linux uh, years and years ago um, when, for some reason, I couldn't make them with Windows. And uh, I made them with Linux and then took them to a Windows system. It worked fine. Um, the um, my that should do. Uh, well, let's make a different file system type. Okay. I'm in the middle of a video. Let's try this. Oh, I'm sorry. It says, it, it gave me an error message. I was perplexed by the error message. But if I just type yes, there, it, it works. And I think on the NTFS, that would work too if I use the minus F for force at, uh, flag on the mkfs.ntfs command. Okay. In any case, I have it now. So this is my file system. Um, so I guess I should be able to mount this file system. I don't think I can. 
um, my file system actually I always get the order of these screwed up and it says only root can do that and that makes sense so let's sudo and then we'll do this Guess what? I've got a file system there. So let's uh, go over to the file system and um, um, take a look at it. Maybe I should become unroot. I, I don't know if I can access that after I'm not root or oh, I'm not root. Okay. There we go. Let's try to copy a file onto that. is a file. Well, we're not copying a file. We're creating a file. There we go. OK. I should mention there's a directory there called lost and, lost and found. And I don't know what that is. Well, I do. Many, many file systems, um, Unix file systems, create a directory called lost and found. And that is where they store, um, oh, what do you call it? Isolated clusters. When you do FSCK and it finds broken, it, it finds broken pointers and it's got to fix things up. Sometimes if it's got a lot of, a lot of isolated clusters that don't seem to go anywhere, it will just store all of those in uh, lost and found. Uh, you don't really want to use those because um, uh, um, unless you're desperate because they're going to be very hard to use. It's better to go to your backup media, get backups of the files you lost. But if you don't have backups, if, you know, this is your accounts receivable files that you got corrupted and you lost them, you can try to create, recreate things from uh, information in the lost and found directory. And sometimes you will be successful and often you will not be. <laughs> um, at least that's been my experience. Um, in general, you know, it's, you don't want things, you don't want to get that far, but, you know, they're trying to help you in case things do go bad. Okay, well, that is a way to create a, um, a, a file system on disk, um, a disk within a disk. And, of course, we're using more and more of those nowadays for various things, but um, but 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 that's cool. That also means that if I have a fellow like this, and maybe it's got a few problems on it, it's a little bit kind of getting a little bit corrupted. I can put that into a USB port if I have any free USB ports. I'll put that into a USB drive. Now, that should show up here someplace. Uh, a quick and easy way to mount things is <laughs> is by waiting for that little pop-up to come up and then just mount it that way. Um, I don't know. Didn't mount. I, I got there too late. But I often mount things by just popping it in and then it comes up automatically. Um, that is quick and dirty. That way I know what um, 
SDB or you know whether it's SDA or SDB or SDG so we're going to have to guess here well we're already using SD um, um, SDG we're already using for that disk drive oh, how about SD I don't know H Well, let's go back here. It's not A, it's not B, it could be C. Or D. Or E. Or F. Can't be G. Or H. Or I. Or J. No, let's try D2. No, D2. That should be a, um, that, that's going to be a partition. How about H? F disk. Oh, I got to be root. That was stupid. Okay, and it's got one, um, one, apparently a FAT32 style f um, uh, file system on it. Um, it's not mounted, so um, it, you know I, I missed mounting it. But it, it's not mounted. It's there. It's on SDH. Um, or SDH. Uh, uh, well, the disk drive is SDH. The partition on the disk drive is SDH1. So I could copy this thing by doing um, something like this. DD IF equals slash DEV slash SDH1 slash OF equals Zero, zero, I don't know. This is an arbitrary number, but I, I'm choosing it because I used it before. I could just do this, and it should copy that whole file system onto that uh, file. And that takes five or ten minutes, so I'm not going to do that. But I did do that before. And so what I had when I did that before is a file that is um, 16 gigabytes, because that's a 16 gigabyte flash drive. Why is it 16 gigabytes? It's, all, it's less than half full. Well, that's because it copies every block from the disk. So whether it's empty or whether it's full, it's going to be 16 gigabytes. Well, every block from the file system. And um, which means I should be able to mount. Let's you mount this first one here, because uh, the one I had been using before, because I want to use the same mount point. Target is busy. Somebody's on that. Um, okay. I could use the F fuser command or the FO 
FS command to get a listing of all the open files to find out who's on that thing. But I'm pretty certain it is going to be me. So let's exit. Yeah, there I am right there. Let's go over here. Now let me become a root. Now let me U mount slash MMT. Now let me mount uh, mount, not U mount, slash home slash dmandel slash 003 whatever. And I want to put that on the MMT. Cool. It's mounted. Now I could go over here and I can read that. And, you know, I can do anything I want there. Let me um, become on route. Let me go over there as me, hopefully. And I've got things here. Um, uh, S, S O Southern France. ODP, that must be a, um, an open uh, um, LibreOffice presentation, maybe. I don't know. So that will show that I can read these files. Now, those files, oh, if I can reach this, those files came off of here. Not the, only those files, the entire file system came off of here. I could have copied the whole disk drive, uh, all the partitions, everything. Now, I chose just to copy the first and only file system, and I will describe why. Uh, Gardens of Southern France. Um, That looks more like southern China than southern France, but there's southern France. Okay. Um, anyway, once again, um, we copied that thing off of here as a file system. Normally, I copy things off of here file by file, but I chose to do it as a file system. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one reason is suppose I have a disk drive and it's going bad. Or suppose I have a disk drive and I'm a, um, I am work for the NSA and it's coming through the airport and I want to copy some guy's hard drive. What I do is I use the DD command. I can copy the entire hard drive in about five minutes. And, um, and if it's something like this, it's well, <laughs> it took me five minutes to copy this. But I can copy these quickly using the DD command. There's options on the DD command. And there's a little variant of the DD command called DD underscore rescue, where I can skip broken areas in the disk drive and get all the good information that I can get down into a file. The reason I would do that is if I've got a hard drive that's going bad, the more I use it, the worse it's going to get. So the, if I'm working with a hard drive going bad, the first thing I do is I copy the entire hard drive to a file. And then anything I do from then on, goes I do it off that file. I don't do it off the physical hard drive. The other thing is if I'm doing, an, say, an investigation, which I don't do, but, you know, if I was working for the FBI doing an investigation on child pornography or whatever, I can copy the hard drive once with one command and leave no fingerprints that I ever touched the thing. Uh, it leaves good evidence for court cases. And then I examine the hard drive, but I'm not examining the real hard drive. I only did one copy off of it. And so there's in computer forensics, this is a very, very powerful tool um, that we use all the time, or I don't use because I'm not into computer forensics. But but it's used, a, actually, I, 
I do use this. I use it often for trying to recover data off broken hard drives. Um, and it's a very powerful tool. So that's why I went through that. Um, I will say, let's see, what was I going to, let's do the mount command. Well, I, I will say that when you mount things of this type, uh, when you mount files onto the file system, the, Linux uses something called a loopback device. Generally speaking, you don't have to worry about that nowadays. It's all transparent. Linux will create the loopback devices. It will uh, take care of all of that for you. So I won't say too much about that. If you're working on an old, old version of Linux, Linux wasn't very good about creating loopback devices. And you had to use the command loss, a loss tube to create loopback devices. And then you had to actually address that loopback address as part of your mount command. And it was kind of a mess. The other thing that I want to say is um, that we use, um, if I can remember it, um, can't remember it. So we will forget that. Um, OK. Finally, I want to end this by saying there are some advanced file systems that people use that, that I'd like to mention just a little bit. And uh, the uh, advanced file systems I want to mention just a little bit are one is called LVM, Logical Volume Manager. And the idea there is file systems cannot be, um, you know, once you make them, you can't expand them. Um, they can only be made on a partition on one hard drive. So if you need a 12 gigabyte uh, file system, you can't make it unless you can buy a 12 gigabyte hard drive. Um, there's, you know, if you make a file system and it's too big, you can't shrink it. Um, once you've started to use it, you've got to just delete it and make a new one. Um, they're somewhat inflexible, particularly as we're using more of these centralized storage facilities. So um, a lot of that can be handled with LVM which adds a layer of abstraction. And what we do is we put um, sort of file systems or partitions within the LVM thing. And then a layer up, we make um, um, a file system on top of the file systems so that you've got kind of a layer. And you can um, add partitions, subtract partitions, um, do all sorts of things in an LVM environment, logical volume manager, that you can't do using plain, simple file systems like I've used. Although with things like um, uh, XFS and ZFS, Linux is moving more and more to merging LVM into putting it at the file system level. It's really not there yet, but I expect in a few years it will be, and we won't need LVM. Um, the other thing is there are rated devices. Rated devices, I'll let you read about elsewhere. Um, you, you know, the simplest rated device is where you have two disks and they mirror one another. Uh, you write something. When you do a write, it writes to both disks. When you do a read, it reads from, well, whichever, whichever disk it can get the information from fastest. So RAID is, you know, mirroring is actually a way of speeding up data access if you have, if you're doing more reading than you are writing. Um, the um, 
and then there's various levels of raid there's there's striping there's you know um, most people either use level one which is simple disk mirroring or level five which puts a lot of stuff together to give you uh, but you need at least three disk drives to use level five two disk drives to use level one um, another thing I should mention is there's something called I think it's cram FS which is a compressed file system where it does compression of the file system on the fly and that allows you to get more information in the same amount of space of course it also slows down access a little bit because um, because um, uh, um, because it takes computing time to compress and decompress things um, the other file system that I find somewhat interesting is one I call Union FS although I think the name may have changed in recent years but it's a Union FS is kind of a cool file system um, it what it does is it um, it's really for use with something like a CD-ROM where you have a device that you can't um, uh, read and write from but you want to read and write from it you can only read so what you can do is you set up a, uh, uh, the Union FS sets up a second file system that may be a small file system on a a thumb drive or a hard drive or something and that w and the way it reads things from the uh, file system is it will read from the small new one you set up and it tries to get the file but if the file doesn't exist there then it goes to the CD-ROM and picks it off the CD-ROM so um, distributions like Nopix, the Nopix distribution, which uses a very compressed file system, something like CramFS, but it also uses this UnionFS. So if you put uh, Nopix on a device like this, like a flash drive or a hard drive, what it will have is it has just a copy of the CD-ROM or of the DVD which you can't write to but then it has a second file system that you can write to and the way it does things like suppose you add a user and if you add a user then uh, the user information has to go in the file slash etc slash um, password so when the new user tries to log on the system says is there a, a file in the um, is there a file in that new little area the persistent day or the, the the new area called slash etc slash password yep okay cool we'll go on but then you type in some command and the system says well in this new area is there a command by the name of slash bin slash sls and um, the system says no there's no I, I, invisible to you there's no slash bin slash ls in the new area but there is on the cd-rom so we'll use that one and that is really cool it means that a system like Nopix if you put it on a media like this it's still using kind of this DVD image but it adds to the DVD image the ability to save your work you can write a document and you can save it you can add a new user to the system indeed you could even upgrade the system and I routinely add things like Skype Skype's not part of um, part of uh, Nopix, but it's part of my Nopix. Um, um, oh, Flash, Flash, I don't believe is in Nopix, or at least 
it's a broken version if it is, but it's part of my Nopics. So, uh, you know, hey, that's cool. Um, so those are some other file systems, advanced file systems that we are, um, um, that we have in the Linux world that we do use. Um, and, um, and this has been, this has been a survey of file systems. And uh, I think we've talked about a lot. I imagine this whole thing is a couple hours long. Um, but I th hope we've covered file systems pretty well. And um, the main thing to do with file systems, like anything else in Linux, is, you know, use this stuff. Experiment with it. Uh, especially, you know, the fact that you can make um, make a file on disk and then just use that as a file system so that you can reformat things, format it any which way you want, um, mount it, um, um, damage the thing, run FSCKs, um, uh, you know, um, the way we learn is by doing and by experimenting. Nobody ever learned to play the violin by uh, listening to violin being played. They learn to play violin. Well, they do do some listening, but they also, uh, the bulk of it is you learn to play violin by playing violin. You learn to um, do Linux by doing Linux. And uh, that's why open source is so great, is because you can do it. Um, it's open to everybody. OK, that is everything I had to say and more. Um, so I end this video. Bye-bye.